Mike of ABC News. I covered the Pentagon uh, for a period of uh, close to eight years, including uh, the buildup and consummation of the uh, Persian Gulf War, as, as well as its uh, aftermath. It's uh, a great pleasure for me to appear at an academic institution of such towering excellence, refinement in its approach to public policy, and aptitude for nurturing the political leadership of this country that uh, I suspect it will one day be known as the Kennesaw State U of Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> I'd also like to clarify for purposes of uh, this audience, uh, I've seen other guests uh, to appear here, that uh, Peter Jennings had nothing whatsoever to do with uh, writing any of my remarks. <laughs> and uh, just the last uh, bit of introductory business, uh, I was uh, wondering why I was selected to moderate this panel. Uh, and then in doing research for the book that's under discussion tonight, I came to the conclusion that I was selected for the sole reason that I had not authored a competing book. Uh, unlike your editor's uh, choice. Um, we gather uh, this evening to discuss the uh, question uh, as stated Colin Powell and Saddam Hussein, uh, did we snatch a modest victory from the jaws of triumph? The question suggests that, uh, as Mick mentioned, uh, even at dinner in an age of instant replays and short attention spans, even the process of historical revisionism is compressed. Not too long ago, this nation and much of the world celebrated an apparent triumph of military planning, technology, and execution, coupled with a diplomatic tour de force unparalleled in the post-war period. Let's remember, as I do having covered these events, that when Iraq attacked and quickly overran Kuwait in August of 1990, the overwhelming consensus among experts was first that Kuwait had ceased to exist as an independent country, uh, that Iraq, if uh, not uh, themselves likely to overrun Saudi Arabia, would dominate that country politically as well as the Emirates and other states in the region for the foreseeable future. A third assumption was that any effort to dislodge Iraq's battle-hardened forces of uh, a million or somewhat less than that, armed with grade B-plus Soviet technology, any effort to do that would be inordinately costly. For uh, no such U.S. effort would be supported by our traditional European allies, the possible exception of Margaret Thatcher's uh, Britain. Uh, or our Arab friends, to say nothing of sentiment on the so-called Arab street. Now, from this unpromising beginning, Bush, Baker, Cheney, Scowcroft, along with Powell and later Schwarzkopf, came instantly to the rescue of Saudi Arabia. They fashioned a military alliance of more than two dozen countries. They won the grudging approval their actions by the Soviet Union, at that time still the Soviet Union. Uh, they gained international sanction from the Security Council. They conducted the most massive military buildup uh, and effective military buildup uh, since uh, D-Day. They won the approval of both houses of Congress despite 47 nay votes in the United States Senate. They conducted the most successful conventional air campaign in the history of warfare. They achieved victory on the ground inside of 100 hours. And they achieved all the stated military and political objectives, the expulsion of Iraqi forces from Kuwait, the return 
and restoration of Kuwait's legitimate political leadership, the neutralization of Iraq's threat to its neighbors, control over Iraqi weapons of mass destruction, and uh, as kind of a capstone, uh, they managed to wind up receiving more than $60 billion in financial contributions from allies to uh, defray the cost of the effort. I say all this not in opposition to the thesis of the book under discussion this evening, The General's War, but to suggest that the two authors have willingly assumed a heavy burden in advancing their thesis. Having read The General's War, I can say that it's brilliantly reported and argued, filled with new information and fresh insights, and very well written. In fact, a pleasure to read. Whether it sustains the burden I've described is a subject best argued by our panelists and decided by you, our audience. Let me introduce the panelists uh, without further ado, and I'm going to start from my left, uh, Lieutenant General Bernard Trainer, co-author of The General's War, is the Director of National Security Program at the John F. Kennedy School of Government. Michael Gordon is a reporter for the New York Times, the Chief Pentagon Correspondent, and soon to, soon to be the Moscow Bureau Chief. And as uh, someone who served in Moscow from 1982 to 1984. I envy the experience you're about to have. Uh, to my far right, Lieutenant, Lieutenant General Thomas Kelly was the former plans and operations officer for the Joint Chiefs of Staff and a very familiar face as one of our major Pentagon briefers throughout the Persian Gulf War. And Philip Zelico is a former National Security Council staff member an assistant professor of public policy at the John F. Kennedy School of Government. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Mick Trainer, General Trainer, and uh, ask you to defend your proposition that on the military side of the Gulf War, a moderate victory or a modest victory was snatched from the jaws of triumph. Uh, thank you, Bob. Ladies and gentlemen, it's delightful to see you here on such a wretched night. And I hope we live up to your expectations of uh, intellectual appetites. Um, our book is not just a history. We have tried to get to ground truth concerning the events of the Gulf War the planning process, the decision-making, and the execution. Not just for the record, but more to determine what it says about American military and political culture and, had, and its impact and its application to today and tomorrow. In the process, I think we have turned up some surprising insights. The perfect war led by perfect generals, turns out upon close examination, like most things upon close examination, to me not quite what it looked to be at the outset. Certainly it was a war without precedent. It was a war in which high technology, which you all saw on television, supplemented the bayonet. It was a war in which one side saw all and heard all, and the other side was deaf, dumb, and blind. It was a war in which skilled soldiers <clears throat> opposed an army bred to blind obedience. <clears throat> It was the first war in history where air power, not ground power, was the dominant arm. It was a war in which a million soldiers 
stood opposed to one another with thousands of guns and tanks, but only one side was affected, and the other side provided little more than target practice for the first. It was a hundred-hour ground war, unprecedented, with enormously low casualties. The perfect war. Clean, clinical, decisive. Or was it? If you make the basic assumption that military action does not have as its objective military victory, but a political goal, a political end. That's why we use military force. Did military force do what it set out to do? This we question in the book. If we had the complete victory, the perfect victory, we would not find ourselves still faced with problems in the region. If we had defeated our enemy decisively, would there have been an assassination attempt against the former president when he was visiting Kuwait? Would we have had the defeated Hitler of our times continuing to work on chemical and biological and perhaps nuclear weapons? as is the charge today by the UN representatives? Would a defeated Hitler have been able to threaten his neighbors again as recently as a few months ago when Saddam Hussein sent some of the same divisions that he had employed in the initial invasion of Kuwait to sally forth towards Kuwait again? And if we had concluded the war successfully, would we have had a man by the name of Yusuf, who was just recently captured by American and Pakistani authorities and reportedly was in the employ of Iraq as the mastermind behind the Trade Center bombing in New York two years ago and other plans for destruction? If the victory was comparable to the effort that went into it, one would think that these threats would not exist. And yet, while we consider it the perfect war completed four years ago, obviously Saddam Hussein does not, and he continues to be a threat, maybe not to Kuwait, but indeed to the United States. So we looked at the war to find out what was behind the decisions, why, not just the events, but the whys of the events. Why were the decisions made, on what basis, and in retrospect, were they the correct decisions? Monday morning quarterbacking? Of course it's Monday morning quarterbacking. What coach doesn't look at the, the game films the day after so he can improve the performance of his team for the future? And in a sense, that is what we are doing in this book. We look at what happened and were the lessons drawn from the war, legitimate ones, in terms of formulating American military and diplomatic process for the future. And I think we perhaps answered most of those questions during the course of the some 500 words of the book. Thank you. Thank you, Mick. Uh, I meant to ask you as a creature of television, if you could possibly limit your remarks to eight seconds. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I'd like uh, General Kelly to uh, uh, respond to the uh, overall uh, military assessment of Mick, and then uh, we'll do the uh, political strategy and assessment, and then get into some, some of the really interesting specifics. The Gulf War wasn't a perfect war. Uh, there never has been one. 
we did a lot of good, good things and we did some bad things. We did mostly good things. Uh, before I get into to what I want to say, I know that you all are expecting, because this is Harvard, a very erudite talk. And of course, I used to work at the Pentagon, so that would just sort of follow. But I was a cavalryman all my life. I the 6th Cav, the 11th Cav, the 4th Cav in Vietnam, and uh, I'm reminded of what they said about George Custer, said when he signed into his first unit, that he was so stupid that even the other cavalry officers noticed. <laughs> <laughs> and of course the English said they invented the wheelbarrow to teach the Irish how to walk on their hind legs. <laughs> That's not true, we invented it ourselves and it's not easy when you're down there on, on all fours. <laughs> And these folks are talking about subtle nuances of who did what to who on what day and what CIA memo said what. And, and uh, the operations types are pretty direct folks. Uh, we look for an azimuth and, and go at it and try, try to win. Uh, we did win. And we did the right thing. And that's particularly gratifying to me because my war was Vietnam. And we walked out of that jungle, a dirty <coughs> column of dirty men, battered, bloodied somewhat bowed and came back and built the best army that the world has ever seen. And when I say army, I mean Marine Corps and Navy and Air Force. I was a soldier and that's the reason uh, I say that. And we were able to go to the Gulf and, and do fairly well. We took on the fourth largest army in the world, had uh, 9,000 tanks, 4,500 artillery pieces, 1,000 combat aircraft and about a million men. And we smashed it, 60,000 prisoners in two days. 148 Americans were killed in that war. 148 bereaved families, and you know, we're all sorry for them, but, but given the numbers involved, it was unbelievable that the casualties were that low uh, with 42 days of aerial bombardment and 100 hours of ground combat. Saddam Hussein went from having the fourth largest army in the world to the second biggest army in Iraq. <laughs> and we could have gone further. There was nothing to stop us, and I'll tell you why we didn't. I would mention been a lot of talk about how the Air Force were the first time this and that. I'll tell you what an Iraqi tank battalion commander said. He said when that air war began he had 39 T-72 tanks and 42 days later when it ended uh, he had 31 left. After 20 minutes with the 2nd Cavalry he had zero. Uh, our technology incidentally was quite good. You know we were taking those tanks on at 3,000 meters plus and getting first round hits, and for a tank gun that is unheard of in the world, uh, and the M1 tank uh, got a lot of vilification as it was coming along, as you may recall, it's the best tank in the world, and most of that vilification came from the press. Uh, and, and Michael's a good friend, and I'll tell you a war story about him a little bit later on. Uh, the reasons we won the war, of course, were to support of the people, which is a real element of combat power. It, it really, truly is. Didn't have it in Vietnam. The leaders, and Bob mentioned who they were, uh, Bush, Cheney, Powell, Baker, and Scowcroft, and they, they, were the, uh, they were the big guys in this. Uh, the men and women who fought the war, no group of Americans any better than any other group, but they were the best trained, equipped, and led expeditionary force that this country has ever deployed, and then the technology that we had at our disposal. Uh, the reason we won was because we had an objective which was enunciated by the President of the United States, by the UN, and acquiesced in by the Congress of the United States. And it's interesting to remember what that objective was because it turned out to be a mission, and it was to kick the Iraqis out of Kuwait, to destroy their offensive capability, and to ensure Persian Gulf regional stability. Period. Didn't say go to Baghdad. Didn't say enjoy a triumph, didn't say this, didn't say that, said to do that, and that's exactly what we did. And at 6 o'clock at night on the 27th of February in uh, 1991, when we got a call from the White House Situation Room saying pull down the airplanes, uh, my first emotion was, Jesus, we got them on the run, why don't we squeeze? And the second emotion was, uh, the killing's over. Now uh, the question becomes, did we stop too soon? And the pundits, of course, all say, yes, yeah, we did, but they were the same guys who were saying, don't start it in the first place. And pundits are sort of funny, you know, they, uh, they're sort of like they have a blue belt in karate. That's where you do good on the written part. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, Vince Lombardi used to say, uh, only three things can happen when you throw a pass and two of them are bad, you know, incomplete or interception. 
And, and four things could have happened, I think, had we gone on to Baghdad, had we dominated Iraq. And I think all four of them were bad. Uh, first, we would have gotten more American kids killed. And we didn't have to do that. We had proved what we set out to do. Second, we would have owned the country. I remember briefing President Bush just before we went into Panama. We got that mission on a Sunday afternoon, and we went in on Tuesday night, by the way. It was pretty good at what we do. And, and Colin Powell said to him, uh, you know, Mr. President, you're going to own the country for a while, and you're going to have to pay to fix it. And we didn't want to have to pay to fix Iraq, which would have been billions and billions of dollars. Uh, the third thing is we could have become bogged down in yet another Middle Eastern country. You know, we had the 101st Airborne sitting up there, cocked, locked, and loaded, ready to go. Their helicopter was going, boom, 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 boom. and they could have jumped in them and been in Baghdad in two and a half hours, and there was nothing to stop them. And then you're in a major city with house to house, street to street, block to block combat, and a lot of people on both sides are going to die. And the question I say is why? Why is it our job to go get Saddam Hussein? He's not affecting us at all. 24,000 percent, I heard one, uh, by one account, inflation in, in, in Iraq. I go to Kuwait often, by the way. I, I do business there. And uh, two years ago, an egg cost nine bucks in Baghdad. That's not our fault. Saddam Hussein still has a job. The Iraqi people could fire him tomorrow. The Iraqi people are suffering. That army was destroyed. Believe me, they can't project power outside of Kuwait, I mean outside of Iraq, which is what our, our mission was. But the fourth thing, and I think maybe the most important thing was is sort of twofold. Number one, if a Western country had taken over an Arab country, it would have threatened the Arab coalition. And I think a country like Egypt could have had a great deal of difficulty with that. I think the other Arab states might have fallen out of the, uh, of the alliance. And the second thing is that our overall goal in the Middle East from the very beginning, even before Kuwait was invaded, was Middle East peace, uh, which is a euphemism for Arab-Israeli accommodation of, of one type or another. And had we taken over Iraq and the Arab coalition failed, I think we would have postponed any opportunity we had for that accommodation uh, for a long, long, long time. We didn't. We're now making some pretty solid progress in the Middle East vis-a-vis -vis the Israelis and the Arabs. So I think all things considered in an imperfect world, uh, President Bush and Secretary Cheney and Colin Powell uh, did the right thing. President Bush did it. And I would tell you again that Colin Powell is the finest man that I have ever met in my life. Thank you, General. Uh, Michael Gordon, uh, your book challenges decisions that were made at critical times during this campaign, uh, including the definition of the in objectives, including the uh, meetings uh, between uh, the U.S. military command and the Iraqi command uh, uh, at Safwan. Uh, and I'm wondering whether at root the General's War is an indictment of certain aspects of the military conduct or whether your essential grievance is with the political decisions that were made? Well, I found, I think this um, discussion's been set up very well, point, counterpoint, and uh, we framed the basic issues. But I think to really get into, um, into the subject matter, um, but the degree of uh, sophistication that's required for this audience, we need to take it a step further, and I'll answer that question. Um, I returned um, to the Gulf. I was with Bill Perry in October um, on a whirlwind trip, where um, and Saddam Hussein had just sent the Hammurabi Division earmarked for destruction in the Persian Gulf War, but um, a division that survived virtually intact, back toward um, uh, Kuwait, necessitating the deployment of thousands of American forces there. And if you talk to um, soldiers in the field, uh, the troops um, uh, sitting in a kind of a miserable sand compound somewhere, I have to say that you often got the, um, the uh, view um, from them that uh, we should have done this right the first time around and not had to come back. 
It's an intuitive judgment they're making. These are young troops and soldiers. They're not generals with reputations at stake or political ambitions. They're just soldiers. And I think that political intu intuition is essentially correct that they have. Now, I too, um, to answer your question, Bob, I, uh, like General Kelly, um, as a journalist, um, and General Kelly comes from a family of journalists, which he didn't mention. I don't, hope he's not ashamed mm -hmm. of it. The, um, um, I, too, have the highest regard for the professionalism of the American military. And I've seen them in Panama, and I've seen them in the Gulf, and I think they're very good. And, um, uh, and I think they're well-trained, and they're, and they're well-disciplined, and they're very effective. And in many respects, they're better than their civilian counterparts in, in certain professions. And I also, as a journalist, have looked for um, uh, my share of stories about weapons that didn't work. And um, I have to tell you, when I look at the Gulf War, um, the weapons worked. Any reasonable expectation of how sophisticated technology would work in wartime. Not perfectly, but pretty well. And yet I'm faced with this conundrum. The people were good. The weapons were pretty good. We had six months to plan for the offensive campaign, not six weeks, six months. It happened on a date certain, you know, mid-January, like a, almost kicking off a sports contest. And yet, when it was all over and done with, the primary war aim, one of the primary war aims was not achieved. The Republican Guard was not destroyed. Now notice I am not, and this is a very important point, and this is to respond to something General Kelly said, I am not creating some mythical standard that are holding up some straw man and then accusing the Pentagon of failing to achieve it. I'm not saying they should have gone to Baghdad, although I think one can argue that case, that the case that that option was foreclosed uh, without enough thought and that perhaps it might have been sustainable after all. But that's not what I'm not arguing. I'm holding the Pentagon and the military up to its own standard. They set out to destroy the Republican Guard, as General Kelly said, their offensive capability. This was a goal that was put in writing his explicit goal in writing. And the rationale was to destroy the offensive capability of Iraq, so I couldn't do what it did in October. And also to undermine Saddam Hussein's regime, because these were deemed to be the forces that were most loyal uh, to Saddam Hussein, the most likely, essential to keeping him in power. Um, it was part of the overall logic of the war, which was to overthrow the Saddam Hussein regime. There, I don't think there's any question that we hoped that the administration hoped it would be done by a coup from the Iraqi military, but they were trying to knock the props out from the regime so it would fall of its own weight. That explains the bombing campaign, et cetera. I think that was a perfectly reasonable approach. And yet, when it was all over and done with, half the Republican Guard escaped. How can this be? And that's the essential mystery looked out in the, in the book. Now, to more directly answer your question, I think this happened for basically three reasons, and I'll try to be concise. One, and I won't, we can get into this later if, if people want to. In purely military terms, it happened because uh, there was a failure of planning among the various services, a coordination among the services. And one thing that was striking to me in researching the book is the extent to which the Army planned its piece of the war, the Marines planned their piece of the war, the Air Force planned their piece of the war, and, and nobody really took into account how what they were doing affected anybody else. And it's my view, which I'm prepared to support that neither General Schwarzkopf nor General Powell sufficiently harmonize these plans. Um, I don't want to belabor this because I have two other points to cover, but in essence, in purely military terms, the theory was that the Marines were going to suck the Iraqis in and distract them in the ground war, and that the Army would come around from the West and cut them off like a scythe. In reality, what happened is the Marines pushed the Iraqis out like a piston. They were really too successful for this plan, and the Iraqis headed north before the army, big army war machine really had time to gain up sufficient momentum. And part of the reason this happened was because the Marines and Army weren't really connected and didn't really fully appreciate what each other one side was doing. The other reason we didn't completely destroy the Republican Guard was the failure to understand the adversary. And certainly it's a real danger to, over, to underestimate your enemy. Nobody wants that. You know, you get into a bigger fight than you anticipated. I can, I can Though from my reporting experience, General Kelly can recount, you know, I'm sure there are cases where that could be a tragedy, loss of life. But it's also a mistake to, to overestimate your enemy, which is exactly what happened in the Gulf. They may have been the fourth largest army on paper, um, 
but they, uh, this was an army that acquitted itself fighting, well, maybe fighting Iran, and was overmatched fighting the United States. And as a consequence of this, it was a working assumption in, in CENTCOM and in Washington that this was an army that was going to stand and fight, and that there was going to be a, a, a big battle, and, um, and that could be destroyed. And I think that, uh, in reality, this was an army that, after, particularly after the Kafchi battle in late January of 91, was determined pretty much to flee when the ground war came, and that's pretty exactly what it did. And uh, because we over, we exaggerated the prowess of the Iraqis and their will to fight, not sufficient attention was put into the war plan, into cutting them off at the pass. We basically assumed we'd have a force-on-force -force engagement, there'd be a big battle, they'd be destroyed, hopefully low cost to us, and that would be the end of it. There was less, not sufficient attention, well, what if they don't stand and fight? Then what do we do? What if they head back toward Basra? How are we going to handle that? The third issue, and just to wind up my, my segment here, and this is going to be a contentious one, particularly for General Kelly, I think, but I think another reason we didn't achieve a complete victory in the Gulf, and for, you know, and as full of victories we should have had, and the American military deserved to have um, for their efforts and sacrifice, you know, these people sacrifice their lives not to have to go back there and, and keep a fly over the skies of Iraq indefinitely, is um, my view is um, the doctrine of decisive warfare, and which is partly a political doctrine of General Powell. And um, we can get into this later, but I think that the doctrine of decisive warfare, where the aim, which is widely shared in the military, that the purpose of military force is to win a victory with overwhelming force and then withdraw as quickly as possible with as few entanglements in the region, uh, in an ironic way, undermine the achievements of the Gulf War very quickly. One, because of this doctrine, one re in partly because of this doctrine, when Iraq um, put forces on the um, border of Kuwait, the United States didn't lift didn't do anything to, dis to try to dissuade an invasion if it might have been discouraged. I think it's fortunate we didn't in re retrospect because that gave us an opportunity to destroy a lot of the weapons of mass destruction, but, but the fact is the doctrine of decisive warfare uh, doesn't like to use military force to send political signals. Sometimes it's useful to do that, even if you don't know what you're going to do next. Two, um, it is a fact that the uh, General Powell and, and, um, and the military, with some for some reason, um, you know, uh, we're reluctant warriors and reluctant to go to war and take on the rollback of Kuwait, which caused some friction with Dick Cheney and others in the Pentagon. And but three, when it came to the end of the war, uh, it's my view based on research and of this how the decision was made, that um, the American military supported a premature conclusion, partly for political reasons, because they were afraid of the adverse impact of the highway of death among public perceptions in the United States, a misplaced fear, public opinion polls show, if anything, public thinks we should have continued, because of a misplaced uh, notion that the, the coalition was about to come apart. I found no evidence of that. And then after the war was over, on Safwan and other occasions, even after the war was over and a ceasefire was declared and it was determined that half the Republican Guard had gotten out, there were still opportunities to squeeze Iraq and get more of what uh, we wanted in the region. Um, and uh, I'll just mention this one example and close, but at the end of the, and that will take me back to my trip to Kuwait, at the um, end of the war uh, with the Iraqis uh, attacking the Shiites, who we, the United States, inadvertently encouraged to revolt with clandestine radio stations and Voice of America and President Bush's exhortations to get rid of Saddam Hussein, they were getting clobbered. Uh, we were doing nothing about it. And it wasn't clear all of our aims were going to be met. And a number front, the United States had the option. It didn't have to evacuate its troops from the region in two, three weeks. I was there at the time, um, a period or a month period. It could have stayed there for a period of time, a couple of months, um, and, um, and occupied a portion of Iraq, sat on the oil fields, and waited to see how the post-war negotiations played out. This, by the way, was a course of action that Margaret Thatcher had recommended to Prince Bondar when she was prime minister, and I think if she had been prime minister at the end, it would have made a difference. And it's a course of action that Tom Pickering, who was then the United States ambassador to the United Nations, recommended to the White House. And his judgment was, in recommending this, that this is something he could get through 
the United Nations, because that was his job, to make sure uh, plans like this could sort of, um, you know, could pass muster with the coalition. And, you know, it could be, there would be some UN resolution or, or something like that. But this plan was rejected. Baker took this plan to Riyadh after the war, but Schwarzkopf, General Schwarzkopf, rejected it because he feared it would lead to a, quote, entanglement of American forces in the region. And General Powell wasn't too crazy about it either. And so um, when I was, to wind up, when I was with Bill Perry um, uh, uh, just in October, he was saying, well, you know what we need? We need a demilitarized zone uh, around uh, Kuwait and that will prevent the Iraqis from ever menacing this region again. And I said to him, I said, well, you know, there's a, I was thinking to myself, well, you know, there's a long, this is not a new idea. There was an opportunity to put in place this exact thing. And it didn't happen because the American military was afraid of becoming entangled in the region. And the end result is we're doing no-fly zones over Iraq, and we're sending, every time Saddam Hussein wants to send a division down toward the Kuwait border, we have to respond. And that's, um, with that, I'll, I'll end my uh, presentation. Uh, Phil Zellico, uh, perhaps you can share with us uh, the political insight as to why the administration made the critical decisions that uh, Michael Gordon and Mick Trainer are uh, subjecting to criticism at this time. Um, I'll try. I was not uh, a person principally responsible at the NSC staff for uh, um, working on all of those decisions. I was present while some of these decisions were made, uh, both at the beginning and at the end of the crisis, and was on the fringes of some others. But what I wanted to start by commenting on is uh, I want to uh, step back as an academic. I was in the government. Now I'm an academic. In fact, I used to be a career diplomat uh, and had been in the government for a number of years. So you step back and try to get some historical perspective on all these things. That's what this book is really trying to do. If this book doesn't help you get some historical perspective on an important current event, it, it fails. I don't think it fails in those terms. Because all victories are perfect in the hour of triumph. And all victories are flawed in the years of reflection. Uh, this has been true with every war the United States has fought in this century. Um, if you think the debates over whether the Gulf War ended too soon, uh, think about the debates over whether the Korean War should have ended at the 38th parallel. Now, that was a debate that makes this one pale into insignificance. I, too, like General Kelly, uh, um, think actually that this victory, when people look at it with some historical perspective, is going to look uh, um, Modest uh, is uh, not quite an adequate term to describe how it will look. The United States did destroy the fourth largest army in the world, um, an army that was deployed 10,000 miles away from the United States, and it mastered the forces to destroy it with about 150 days of preparation. Um, that's uh, 10,000 miles, 150 days, fourth largest army. That equation will, may never be matched. I hope there's never an occasion to have to match it. This was accomplished with 148 killed. Now, of course, the answer to that is, well, what a one-sided war, though, where the Iraqis were so overmatched. Now, if you pick a caricature of a one-sided war, I actually did. I said, what's a good one-sided war to compare this with? How about the German conquest of Poland in September 1939? You remember, this took three weeks. The Germans surrounded Poland from three sides geographically, and then the Russians invaded Poland simultaneously from the fourth side. And this is the one with the panzers versus the horse-mounted lancers. The, uh, the crushing German blitzkrieg of Poland over in three weeks cost the German army 45,000 casualties. Now, that was a one-sided war. And that was 45,000 casualties. So 148 killed to me, I don't take for granted. I noticed, too, that uh, Iraq today, if it had not been for this war, there is no doubt in my mind that Iraq would today, as we sit here, be targeting Israel with nuclear weapons, contemplating the final solution to the Israeli question. And there is actually abundant evidence that uh, we could go into at length that shows how advanced Iraq's plans were for not only initiating but waging and surviving a nuclear exchange with Israel. Um, I also noticed that the United States uh, assembled the most elaborate diplomatic and military coalition I can think of in history. 
I mean, I, I uh, went back and think about the Napoleonic coalitions, the second or third coalition, try to find a coalition of equal diplomatic or military complexity, and I simply cannot find a rival to it. So the, uh, the accomplishments at those levels are just uh, staggering and deserve some serious study. Secure access to Persian Gulf oil, a diplomatic revolution in the Middle East, um, modest victory. Uh, if that's a modest victory, well, that's, uh, we have high standards. I actually thought, though, that the title of the forum, the uh, Modest Victory from Jaws of Triumph, was a bit obnoxious. I thought it was obnoxious because basically it's a marketing tagline. But what it is is that since uh, a lot of Americans have this kind of intuitive sense it's an incomplete victory, you have a marketing headline which says, the victory was incomplete. And I must say, uh, uh, Mick kind of set this up a little bit. If this had been perfect, then we wouldn't have all these problems. Well, of course, the implicit assumption is if they had done something else, it would have been perfect. Well, no, actually, this book doesn't make that argument. So this is the problem is you set up this marketing headline. General Kelly then responds to that marketing headline. And this is a meaningless debate because actually the book doesn't make this argument. The book is much better than that. If you read the book, the book actually, I think, makes very sound arguments throughout. Now, I would rewrite a few sentences in the book here and there. But I must say, I, uh, let me be complimentary about the book. Because um, the temptation in a book like this is, since everybody thought the victory was perfect, the easy path for this book is to play gotcha up and down the line. Flaw, 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 flaw. Now, as a marketing tool, that's the story I've got to sell, because people aren't going to go out and buy my book when I say, this confirms what you already thought was the case. So as a marketing tool, I got to do a little bit of gotcha. But I got to tell you, the book's actually better than that, because that would be the easy book to write. That will be the revisionist account, and then three years from now, somebody's going to have to go write the synthesis, you see, that's going to compare the orthodox account and the revisionist account and come up with the next generation balanced account. What I have to tell you is that in many respects, this book actually does provide that synthesis. The book does not just play gotcha. If you read the book, the book is actually a fairly rounded account. It is meticulously careful at providing a balanced story that attempts to understand the motivations of everybody involved. And I think is the book actually is going to hold up for a considerable period of time, especially on the military issues uh, because of the access they've had to documents. But even in the political issues that I know something about, it uh, is generally reliable um, and uh, a very high order of reporting. Uh, and of contemporary history. What I do want to engage uh, you to think about are these issues of the definition of success. Um, and again, I want to push it past the straw man mar caricatures. Of course, you have the nominal definition of success, which is this is the one we put forward, and this is what Michael talked about. And I actually believe that the book makes a persuasive case having to do with the issue of destruction of the Republican Guard, success, and, and complete completion of the envelopment operation heading toward Basra and whether the 24th Mechanized Division and the 101st Airborne should have had another day of operations. Um, I think actually the book makes a, a strong case there. And I must say, I heard Colin Powell tell President Bush on February 27, 1991, that we were currently engaged with the Hammurabi Division and we would not end the war until that engagement was over and that we thought that was going to happen in a couple of hours. And uh, I don't think President Bush understood that the Hammurabi Division was not going to be destroyed at the end of that, at the time he was going to end that war. Now, by the way, that means that there was a lot of friction going on. Because then the point you get out of this, too, is I admire Colin Powell. And I think he has many admirable qualities. It's not just, well, gee, if Colin Powell was wrong about this, must mean he was a stupid general, and therefore, dot, 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 dot. Wrong, wrong. It's just, uh, these are just caricatures of people. Actually, Colin Powell is an extremely capable person. So why is Colin Powell saying this? Well, there are reasons why he's saying this. Actually, the reasons are in this book, if you read the book. And they have to do with the com communications he's having with the field commander and what the field commander knows about what's going on in the Corps and what the Corps commander, in turn, knows about what the division commanders are telling him and so on. And it's actually a very interesting story. But it's a whole level beyond the way we're accustomed here at the Kennedy School to talking about national security issues in the classroom. And that's what we need to do with this book and with the issues this book raises, is not debate these caricatures of should we have gone on to house-to-house -to -house fighting in Baghdad, which, by the way, this book does not argue we should have occupied Baghdad. 
Um, the book does make some arguments about the role of the military in the immediate war termination that I think are very sobering arguments. The book does not contend that the United States did not achieve an enormous diplomatic coup in affecting the indirect occupation of Iraq through UN forces that obviated the need for direct American occupation but achieved the goal of disarming Iraq. This is a brilliant accomplishment, but the book doesn't try to gainsay that. It does raise some really quite troubling issues about the relationship of the military to the immediate war termination and the consideration of the options that Michael was just talking about, which I think were not fully and uh, deliberately considered within the White House in the last phase. And in retrospect, you want to ask, well, why didn't that happen? Because they weren't stupid people, and the national security decision-making process was capably managed, and it wasn't broke. So why did they not do this better? And that's because, you know, in some ways, the civilians weren't as well trained as the military people were in the way military people are trained. Military people are given training that says, here's a situation. We're going to expose you to this situation over and over again in training so that when you encounter this situation on the battlefield, you'll know what to do. And that's one indication of good training. Civilian government officials, it's not like you can put them through war termination exercises. But the whole way in which we teach at this school and all schools around the country about how to do policy development, how to think through the organization of a policy analysis so that you've adequately and thoroughly investigated the alternatives you have in a national security decision-making situation. When we teach courses on international relations theory, we don't teach about any of that stuff. The people who graduate from our colleges and universities in this school generally don't have any training in that stuff. And we expect them to do superbly without the training we expect all of our soldiers to have on the battlefield. And so I think there are lessons from this book about the kind of training we need to have, not just for soldiers, but also for diplomats and politicians, too. Well, I have a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, after holding yourself out as uh, just a little old foreign service officer and not a real politician or anything like that, he then takes the path of spare the authors but savage the poor people who put this forum together and frame, <laughs> frame the issue. <laughs> the, 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 other, the other thought I had listening to this uh, <laughs> uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, I, I think I found the one spot on earth where Marxist analysis survives. <laughs> it's really... <laughs> Come to Harvard. I'm going back to Kennesaw. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I would respectfully, as uh, one who uh, read the book uh, over the last several days, uh, I would disagree in one respect, and I want to uh, get uh, the two sides uh, confronting this again. Uh, I think the book uh, does make the case that this was an imperfect or, or modest victory, and I think it does so uh, one of the reasons, as we've discussed, being the Republican Guards, the failure, the survival of many of, uh, of those divisions, not necessarily intact, but uh, able to function well after a brief period of reconstruction. Let me pose three questions and have uh, you gentlemen go at it. Number one, the reason the Republican Guards survived, Mike did a, a fine military analysis, but basically, the reason they survived was because we won the war more quickly than our generals figured. And not a lot more quickly, maybe by a matter of 10 hours, maybe by a matter of a day. Now, all my ethic as a civilian and as an American and as someone steeped in Western philosophy is that when the other guy says, I'm ready to cry uncle, you don't say, wait a minute, I'm going to let the war go another day and bash your brains in. That is exactly what happened. The, the uh, Republican guards were chased out of Kuwait, chased back uh, toward the Basra area. Saddam Hussein said, uh, I'm ready to, basically he said, I'm ready to meet on your terms. And President Bush said, okay, well, let's stop the killing. Uh, would you have preferred that we fudged around for another day and that we had a massive highway of death uh, uh, of the sort, multiplied many times over? Uh, that we had uh, in the area of Kuwait City. That's question number one. Question number two, 
We haven't gone into detail on the concessions that General Schwarzkopf issued at the conclusion of the war. Uh, General Schwarzkopf may be a genius on the battlefield, but no one, uh, he, he did not become a four-star general because uh, of his geopolitical sense. Should not the White House have taken control of that negotiation and told General Schwarzkopf what to do with the Iraqis? That's number two. And the third question is, granted everything that went on beforehand, once you have, and I remember having this out with General, uh, with Admiral Jeremiah at a dinner during, during the event, during the period of the Shiite and Kurdish conflict. Whatever happened before, whether the Republican Guard survived or didn't survive, whatever happened at Safwan, you had a situation where the Shiites and the Kurds rose up against Saddam Hussein at a time when the United States of America still had over half a million troops in the region. If George Bush and all these other people who had made so many excellent decisions beforehand had said, no, this is not what we had in mind at Safwan, I don't want to see Iraqi helicopters uh, flying missions against the Shiites, I don't want to see the Republican Guard units snuffing out the Kurds, it's not going to happen. Would you have had a better feeling about the conduct of the war politically and otherwise? So those are the three issues that I would let uh, you gentlemen clash about. Let, let me take the first one, uh, the business of extending the highway of death and making killing of the Republican Guards the goal. Uh, the issue was the strategy was very good to envelop them, and you can see that on the, the, uh, the uh, board over there. Um, the failure to encircle the Republican Guards was the failure of the execution of the strategy which I lay basically at the, at the feet of, uh, of General Schwarzkopf. In other words, if his assumption that the Iraqis were going to fight in place, that strategy would have worked, and it wouldn't have been the case of necessarily of killing the Republican Guards. They probably would have been encircled, and like the rest of the Iraqis, probably have given up. And if they didn't, then they would have been destroyed. But General Schwarzkopf failed to read the battlefield failed to realize that the Iraqis were collapsing and that they were not going to defend in place and that they were going to retreat. He should have adjusted his plan. Now, this is, is this Monday morning quarterbacking? Yes, in a sense, it certainly is, but the evidence certainly was there, uh, which we should have convinced him that he had to test the assumption that the Iraqis were going to fight in place. Uh, but be that as it may, he didn't read the battlefield, and the end result was that the goal the mission that they had set for themselves was not accomplished, and this is the point that we try to make in the book. Uh, let me get uh, General Kelly to respond to that specific point, and then we'll go to the others. Hear an awful lot about the Republican Guard getting away, and hear about the Hammurabi Division going up there. And incidentally, I agree with the point that that we should should not have countenanced the uh, the attacks on the Shiites and, and and the Kurds, and I think we could have done something about it. But what got away was nipples and dimes; it wasn't the whole units. Uh, the strategy was okay, Mick. The execution of the strategy wasn't any good. And uh, Freddie Franks, the Seventh Corps commander, was reporting something that got misinterpreted by Schwarzkopf or his staff that said the gate was closed, when in fact it wasn't closed, and that's how those tanks were able to escape north. Fog of war, it's unfortunate, but it happened. I think the highway of death uh, was odious, Michael. I think it would have had a much greater impact on the American people had it continued. Uh, even the pilots coming back were a little bit chagrined at you know, having to do that, and it would have been just a mass slaughter. And, and I still say with all the mistakes that were made, it turned out okay. I and mean, uh, that those Republican card divisions ain't threatening nobody, okay? I'd like to just, um, I'll address the Safwan question, you know, so we can leave time for questions too. But just two very quick points on this back and forth here. Um, on the strategy, would it would it have been, would the United States have to, had to have acted in an inhumane and callous and brutal way to have completed its warring of destroying the Republican Guard? Now, uh, for two quick points. One, I don't know how you destroy a Republican Guard. If, if that's your war aim, I, I don't know how to do it nicely. Um, the goal was to destroy them, not to chase them out of Kuwait, not to render them combat ineffective to destroy them, said in writing. 
maybe there's not a nice way to do that, but once you've taken that on, I think you need to complete that and just face what, what you're about. I put this question to General McCaffrey. Um, he was, General McCaffrey and General P in the 18th Airborne Corps, uh, he wanted McCaffrey was going to go to the gates of Basra, not into Basra, to the canal. He had received permission to do so from his superior, General Luck, who's now in Korea. And General P wanted to put a brigade north of Basra. He's now Schwarzkopf. He's now the head of the Central Command. And he essentially would have bottled up the Iraqi forces. You, they could have gotten off their equipment and walked north. You didn't have to kill any last uh, one of them any more than you had to kill them in the ground campaign himself. And that was their plan of the people in the field. So not all the people wanted to end the war in the U.S. Army. McCaffrey I'm, I'm, um, was about to engage in a climactic battle. General P wanted to put his brigade north. General Arnold, who was the chief operations officer in Riyadh, said on the record, and we quote it in the book, that he really thought it was a mistake to end the war at the time. He was shocked by it. General Waller, who was Schwarzkopf's top deputy, disagreed with the decision. So not everyone agreed with the political intuitions of Powell and Schwarzkopf. And I don't think, it, I, they didn't think it would have been any more brutal than anything would have happened uh, during the war and that it could, their surrender of these people could have been taken. Two, there weren't going to be any more highways of death because after the first highway of death, uh, various restrictions were put into place to prevent the Air Force from doing any more of them. Now, on the Safwan issue, quickly, what happened is, um, as you recall, uh, the uh, Schwarzkopf inadvertently or without thinking it through gave the Iraqis an exemption to fly helicopter, armed helicopters. And the transcript of this meeting is available. We have it, and anyone can get it now. It can be FOIA. It's an astounding transcript. And the Iraqis are incredulous when they achieve this concession. They say they just want to do administrative flights. They say, even a helicopter that is armed in the sky can fly? Schwarzkopf says, yeah, as long as you don't threaten us. And he clearly didn't uh, uh, um, anticipate that what these people had in mind was to um, take it to the uh, Shiites. And uh, there was an absolute um, disconnect between the White House and Schwarzkopf on this point, and the White House should have exerted control. Because later, President Bush, and I'm sure, Phil, you remember this, was in Ottawa, and he condemned the, the Iraqi helicopter flights as a violation of the ceasefire, and Richard Haas and others had to basically yank him off the stage and tell him, no, no, we allowed that to happen. And General Schwarzkopf, Scowcroft told me, and it's quoted in the book, that his first instinct was to repudiate this understanding. Why not? We won the war. We can dictate the terms. That didn't happen for a variety of reasons. But one reason um, uh, was that um, the concern and, uh, of the American military, including General Powell, that helping the Shiites at this juncture would, lead, would be a slippery slope uh, towards a greater involvement in Iraq. A year later, with the election campaign on, the Bush administration completely reversed its decision and imposed a no-fly zone after when it no longer mattered over southern Iraq and, uh, you know, and uh, ordered, told the Iraqis they couldn't launch any attacks there against the Shiites. Just, uh, we're going to go to questions from the audience, but before we do, uh, just because his name begins with Z, and I appreciate what it means to wait uh, <laughs> to the end so many times, we're going to have another uh, comment from Phil. Let me just uh, uh, make a comment about staffing methods. This is, a, this is such a trivial point. You see, you're, you're going to forget this probably half an hour after you leave here. Little point about staffing methods. Suppose Powell shows up for the briefing the final day of the war. Uh, he sits down and basically he just talks to the president. There's question and answer. He brings with him a big map case. He never unzips it, doesn't, or doesn't take it out. Suppose President Bush says, give me a, a, a full dress military briefing on this, a situation report. My guess is that Powell knows he has to do that. Before he goes, he kind of verifies positions of all the American units. And my guess is he might talk to Tom Kelly here. He says, Tom, check where is the 24th MEC now. Um, and Tom picks up the phone and he calls Steve Arnold at Third Army or someone like that. And they say, well, let's check. And all of a sudden, you now have uh, information coming back to Powell and people looking at issues, turning over rocks that were not really turned over. You basically are the, you were adopting a staffing procedure, and it really just a trivial method as to how you set up a meeting that turns out to force you to penetrate the fog of war and maybe it takes you a little bit of time to penetrate it. or maybe you think we need a few hours to establish this important fact but the whole tenor of the meeting changes the whole nature of the decision changes 
Well, the point here I want to make is you don't have to be grand geopolitical thinkers to try to manage problems better and learn from experiences like this. Read a book like this and gain lessons that you can take into a company or into any government agency and into your own daily lives as to how managing the little things right can sometimes help you with the big things. Thank you. Uh, we'll now entertain questions. Uh, there are two microphones, uh, one on either side of the room. Thank yes. you. My name is Avery Gardner, and I'm a sophomore at the college. And one of my strongest memories of watching the television coverage of the war was that every time a United States official stood up in front of a microphone, he talked about the international coalition that was being built. And yet tonight, I've heard all about the United States and the United States fighting Iraq. Uh, I wonder if, I guess perhaps Mr. Gordon and other panelists could comment on the marketing and selling job, the politics behind the building of the international coalition and how that plays out in the aftermath of the war and during it. Well, it was marvelous. I don't think the issue came up because there's the, I don't think there's any debate. Uh, the, and we have a case study here at the Kennedy School that's just been, been done on building the coalition. Uh, President Bush was marvelous in putting an international coalition together, largely for personal contact, and it was also very clever in that he got the international coalition together before he ever really took on the U.S. Congress, which was divided, and kind of put them in the box that, you know, they either had to support him or go in the face of their president who had already put an international coalition together. So he gets full marks uh, on that from the, the point of, uh, of view of our analysis. And also Colin, pa or rather, um, Dorman Schwarzkopf gets full marks on the, the coalition that he put together on the battlefield with disparate uh, nations and disparate cultures. When you just look back on the problems that Dwight Eisenhower had in, in keeping a coalition together in World War II, and he was just de dealing with the English and the, and the French, I mean, Schwarzkopf's problems were enormous, but he did it very well. So coalition-wise, I think that has to get full marks both on the, on the political and diplomatic level and also on the military level. Let, let me add say, to that. Just, um, Shoot, I'm sorry. Uh, just uh, one, third, one quick point, and then you want to yes. say this, just from just a quick point, but I, I think I'm speaking to your question. While the co it was very important to put a coalition together, there are only three countries that mattered in any military sense. The United States, which fought the war um, with Britain, those are the two militarily significant countries, and Saudi Arabia, because you needed their country as a launching pad to do the war. And those were the three countries that counted. Everybody else was sort of there for, you know, to make people feel good and to give it an international patina. Therefore, if the uh, war was, if you wanted expanded your war aims or if you had taken a more aggressive posture, would all members of the coalition gone with it? No. But would, you have to ask, would the key members of the coalition gone with it? I believe they would have. Saudi Arabia, Britain, and the United States. Sorry. General? Yeah, I just wanted to set the stage on how the coalition worked. The French and, uh, and Brits were fully integrated with the U.S. forces, the British First Armored Division and the French uh, Armored Division. Both of them did a very, very good job. We also had, between the Marines and the uh, Army, the Arab Corps, consisting of two Egyptian divisions, about uh, uh, the equivalent of a division between the Saudis and the, uh, and the Kuwaitis, and then two Syrian divisions, which never did get into a firefight, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, the reason we put that corps between the Marines and the Army is so they wouldn't get into an argument with each other. Uh, well, never mind. Thank you. Um, thank yeah. you. Uh, this is actually coalition management is one of the things I did at the White House during this war, and uh, I spent a lot of time on it. And uh, the, uh, the British were a real class act, um, politically and militarily. And, uh, you know, people don't usually don't go out of their way to offer compliments, so I'll offer them a compliment. Then you have to think a little bit as to the, what do you have to do politically when we're not at war in order to uh, <coughs> help make sure that we can sort of take the British for granted as a class act? turns out that you can't take this for granted, and there are things you have to do politically when you're not fighting uh, to do that. And I notice that we're not always attentive to uh, uh, maintaining our allies when we don't need them. And so it's a, it's a point worth mentioning. Yeah, um, just thinking about putting this 
Would you introduce yourself, please? My name's John Simon. I'm a master's student here at the Kennedy School. I'm thinking about putting this war in perspective. I just couldn't think of a war that America has fought in the last century that had such, such a successful conclusion when you think about World War II ending with half of Europe under Soviet occupation and World War I ending with Germany in uh, complete mess. And Professor Zelko already mentioned uh, the Korean War and, Professor, and General Kelly mentioned the Vietnam War. And I'm wondering if uh, Mr. Gordon, General Trainer, could mention a war that has been fought anywhere in this century that had ended with such a successful conclusion. And my sort of on a follow-on, it seems to me that this war, the big mistake of this war was that it was too successful and that it gave the American people an inflated idea of what their army could do. And the result of that has been inflated expectations of what we could do in, say, Bosnia or other places in the world where um, we, we now expect that we can easily uh, deploy our military with, sh with few casualties and achieve such fantastic results. I'll let Michael handle that. He handles all the tough questions. Well, look, we won the war, and um, and I and I actually that's got uh, a nice ring to it. <laughs> although um, it may not appear uh, at first glance, there's much in which uh, General Kelly and I agree on on this, and that um, I think if I don't mean to sound callous, but I think if there can be such a thing as a good war, uh, I think this was it. I think if the nuclear factor alone. Uh, which Phil Zellico mentioned, uh, made it very, made, uh, made it important that um, for the security of the region that this war happened. I don't think that threat would have been nullified through other means. I think that a lot was accomplished. Uh, I think that clearly um, the UN is doing inspections. I think a lot of um, goals were um, were met. What uh, the burden of our argument was that the victory, which was well within our reach, was well within our reach to do considerably better. Uh, than we did, and that um, we sort of denied ourselves the full fruits of our own victory um, and, uh, and therefore have a problem on our hands, although not, not nearly the one of the same dimension that we would have had had there not been a war. So um, that's on that point. And on the other uh, question about, I, I guess I have a different take of it on the Bosnia-Somalia thing. I think that um, one benefit I saw for the United States coming out of this war was um, the enhanced reputation worldwide of the American military um, and for American power, uh, which I thought was very beneficial. And President Bush made a comment, actually, uh, I think at the very end of the war, uh, he said something in effect, and it was fractured syntax, but it was basically, he said it was going to be a long time before somebody ever called our bluff again after this war. And I wish that could have been the case. Saddam Hussein's strategy, I thought, was very rational of trying to induce American casualties and generate it just didn't, a public dissent that just didn't work. Unfortunately, the same strategy was applied, uh, has been applied in, in, in both in Somalia and uh, to a lesser extent in Bosnia. And unfortunately, in Somalia, it did work. And we're going to see that over, I think we're seeing it right now with the evacuation of the coalition forces there. And I, I, I think that need not have been the case. And I, and I, and I think that uh, I, I think the American military is capable of dealing with these gray area conflicts and brush fire conflicts. And I think, I, I think it's unfortunate that the Somalia thing in its own way and the kind of mishandling of the Bosnia crisis has eroded uh, many of the political gains that the United States and the U.S. military achieved from the Gulf conflict. Uh, let I've me heard add that, Michael. Uh, mm -hmm. In the case of Bosnia, it's my very deep belief that that's a European problem. They ought to do it. We ought to stay out of it. And if they can't do that, what can they do? In the case of Somalia, of course, there was a change in administrations between the uh, Gulf War and Somalia. But you, you talk about possibly flawed leadership in the, uh, in the Gulf War. don't agree with that completely. But you can talk about just flat-ass incompetence in Somalia. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Don't sugarcoat it, Tom. No, I'm not. <laughs> hey, Tom, who was the, uh, Tom, who was the chairman of the, of the JCS at the time? I'm going to. I understand. My uh, prerogative to, to make two very brief comments. Uh, uh, comment number one is that I've heard an awful lot of arguments about why the United States should involve itself in Bosnia over the past couple of years. I've agreed with some and disagreed with others. I've never heard anyone say 
that it was vital to American interests. Uh, whereas I heard that argument convincingly in the Persian Gulf situation. Uh, General, I would, I don't want to go into a complete different a avenue, but uh, anyone who read the briefing delivered by Colin Powell and Dick Cheney in December 1992, when they dispatched American forces to Somalia, uh, knows that it was absolutely set forth at that time that the U.S. would draw down to a residual force of about five or 6,000 people on the ground, that it would hand command over to the United Nations, which was better at, quote, nation building, a term that was used in that initial briefing, and that a uh, quick reaction force of uh, the U.S. would remain off the shore to come to the rescue if needed. And it was, uh, um, I don't, I, I saw a, a seamless web of incompetence from the time that the operation uh, began until it, until it ended. Well, I, I, I don't, I, I agree with that. Uh, I supported going into Somalia. I saw the starving children. Uh, we went in to offer humanitarian support, not to fight a war. We got in there, found out we were fighting a war. Uh, the leadership, and I think Colin had retired by this time, Michael, I'm not certain. Uh, that was on the ground there. The, the, the senior leader had never smelled gunpowder or seen a shot fired in anger and decides he's going to go get a deed who's the toughest guy in town with a handful of troops, and that's just plain stupid. Uh, I agree. Sir. Hi, um, my name is Willie Jay. I'm a freshman at the college, and I have a question, I guess, for uh, the uh, uh, gentlemen who were inside the uh, administration during the, uh, during the <coughs> war. Um, yeah, there was a lot... Uh, made of uh, Saddam's um, chemical and biological weapons and possibly uh, possible nuclear capacity. Uh, did, uh, did the administration think at all in deciding to, uh, to end the war uh, that Saddam had been dropping scuds on Israel uh, and uh, Saudi Arabia for uh, much of the war? That he, uh, he might, in desperation, seeing his Republican Guard being crushed along the along the highway of death or wherever, uh, start loading some more lethal warheads on his, uh, on his weaponry? I'd, I'd be happy to take a shot at that. The, the thing that scared us most was biological. As a matter of fact, we got in trouble because we gave some shots to some people that are now coming back to haunt us. Weren't worried too much about chemical because we had the capability to, uh, A, defend ourselves against that, and, and his delivery means weren't very good. And if you're going to load chemical weapons up in a scud, you know, that's a shot in the dark because that's not a very accurate weapon. By the way, do you know how many Israelis were killed by scud missiles? One. Uh, so, you know, that was the grace of God. It, it could have been a lot worse than that. Uh, so it didn't worry too much about chemical, and he had not demonstrated the capability to, uh, to use nuclear weapons. You know, we knew he had worked on it quite a bit. We really didn't give him credit for, uh, for that. And I think one of the reasons he didn't use chemicals is he tended to judge others by himself, and he thought we'd nuke him, which we would not have done. Although we uh, set things that uh, were deliberately designed to uh, scare him into thinking exactly that. Oh, I said it myself, right on TV, looking right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any comment about that. No. Sir. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Brian Bach, Marine Corps. I'm a National Security Fellow here. General Kelly, this question is for you. When I read the book, uh, Mr. Zellico mentioned staffing issues. One of the things that made an immediate impression was the fact that the Secretary of Defense, after hearing the first ground offensive plan uh, briefed by General Johnson, put together his own team and then uh, went over and briefed an unapproved plan to the President while the Chairman was out of town. I can imagine your reaction to that, but what I would like to know is uh, what did you do on the back end of that particular incident? Uh, how was that amended in any way? Well, let me, let me clarify. We were his team. Myself and, and five guys that I had in a special room that nobody knows about in the Pentagon, one of whom was a Marine, by the way. One was Air Force, one was Navy, and one was Army. Then I had an Army colonel heading it up, and I headed that up. Uh, Colin left town, and Cheney got said he wanted to play games way out west. 
uh, we didn't we didn't like having to do it, but you know he was the Secretary of Defense, and uh, we all work for the Secretary. You know the Chairman has no authority; it all flows from the Secretary. That's the way Title Ten is written. So we did what he said. Colin came back, and uh, was not thrilled. Uh, and, and God bless him, he didn't hold it against us because he knew that we didn't have any choice. But some good came from all of that because that same team is the team to put the final war plan together that was briefed to Powell one Friday afternoon, as I recall, then to Cheney, then to the president, all on the same day, and they took it over to the theater, and that's what got executed, and it was written by my little team in my little room. Yes, sir, thank you. I mean, just for two seconds, put in a word for Cheney, who I developed a respect for during this. Cheney perceived he had a problem, and he wouldn't quite put it this way, but I think Cheney was concerned that um, um, Schwarzkopf and Powell were so wary of, um, of uh, engaging the Iraqis that they might not be completely enthusiastic about developing an effective war plan. And he developed his, uh, he sees his alternative plan he believes it served a bureaucratic function of essentially lighting a fire under the American military and uh, putting the fear of God in them that if, if you don't develop a plan that'll pass muster in Washington, my God, civilians will. And I think it did perform that bureaucratic function. He never had any civilians putting any plan together ever. Well, the thing that you briefed, the thing that you uh, Yeah, and, and I'm not criticizing Secretary Cheney. My God, he's one of, one of my heroes in the world. And what happened was with, with his political understanding that we had to do something, and Colin holding them back so we wouldn't do anything precipitous, I think that we started the air war and we started the ground war at exactly the right time. The commander in the field is always going to ask for another week or two before he starts. Uh, you know, it's fear of flying. If you saw the movie uh, about MacArthur the night before Inchon, the, 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 toy, the, the tribulation that a commander goes through the night before a battle is something to behold. And so they all want to postpone it. And the politicians came in and said, hey, you got to you got to move faster. We slowed Cheney down. He speeded us up, and I think we uh, we came on the right solution. And Dick Cheney is a great American, and I wish he was running for president. And I supported him and gave him a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot of money. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, for reasons of time, we ought to uh, limit the questions to those currently in line, uh, and I think uh, that will. Uh, take us to the end of the period. Yeah. Hi, my name is Bert Huang. I'm a junior at the college. Um, it sounds like from your discussion, one of the big questions was why did we end the war at the time we did? Um, I'd like to know how much consideration was given to other non-military concerns, such as um, perhaps keeping Iran in good enough shape to keep Iran in check, or for economic considerations of the enormous cost that cost us to, in I'm treasure terms. On that. Um, so again, this is a, a bit of a confusion. If the issue was, did we end the war too soon, that is, not completing an envelopment that might have captured more Iraqi forces because of, con no, 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 no geopolitics in that at all. They, they thought the gate was closed, the White House thought the gate was closed and it wasn't closed. That's right. So there wasn't any deliberate decision in the White House to leave it open. Um, so there would be no geopolitical rationale for such a decision. Just misinformation. It's right. It's just, uh, this is a decision-making issue. Um, and then the book, I think, presents some useful reflections on that. Then there, uh, there is a larger question, then, is the book, which actually does not make this case, is this, if you wanted to take over Iraq, um, or if you wanted to do something that would shatter Iraq completely, and then there are, there are a number of uh, degrees. It's how far do you go? Do you occupy southern Iraq? Do you go to the gates of Baghdad? Do you go into Baghdad? There are different arguments that can be made. The closer you get to shattering the Iraqi regime, then you get into situations of regional instability and what do the Syrians, Turks, and Iranians do in response to a political vacuum there. And these are very, interest and, and these are very interesting arguments. Uh, but now we're now at the issue of should they have had different war aims than the ones that they had and the ones they arrived at very early on. And there is no doubt that one of the reasons they chose more limited war aims did have to do with this geopolitical consideration. And you can have an argument over whether or not those calculations were good or not. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Hillel Alpert, and I'm an alumnus from the school. And I'd like to ask uh, those panelists who are, 
who support the way the war had ended, uh, if they think that, um, if they don't think that evidence points towards uh, Iraq and Hussein uh, with regard to the uh, incident in the World Trade Center, and um, if not Iraq, then how could that have taken place? I, uh, I don't have the is information. Is anybody with, uh, with expertise to yeah, I, address that? Th there's a lot of organizations in the world that can blow up the Trade Center, and living in a free country makes it relatively easy. We've been tracking, and there's some special operations folks in the audience here to go to school now. Uh, we've been tracking uh, Hamas and, and other groups, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in, in uh, Lebanon for years and years. And, and trying to get a handle on that uh, has been quite difficult. I will tell you this. I think Iraqi terrorists are incompetent. We caught a guy during a war that was sent to Greece to blow up the, uh, the U.S. Information Agency and I believe the embassy. And uh, the CIA got him and they, and they debriefed him and they found out that uh, he had to make his own bomb. He had to get his own map. He had no training whatever. He did not speak any language other than Arabic, and the only thing he had to, to commend him was he was in good physical condition. If there, uh, are, if there are any terrorists watching this program, <laughs> I would like to disassociate myself from um, General <laughs> Kelly's remark about your incompetence. I, <laughs> I, I said Iraqi terrorists. There are others who are... Uh, I don't care which ones. I, I just, I, he spoke for himself on that one. You got that? <laughs> Well, you got to get in the ball game, Bob. You know? uh, if I could just add one footnote to that, if the inference is, is, since Iraqis then carried out these terrorist acts, therefore we should have conquered Iraq to extirpate the source of Iraqi terrorism, well, then you just have to analyze that policy. This is what troubles me is I often encounter this phenomenon, which is that uh, I'll spend uh, uh, 30 pages figuring out why policy X was wrong. And in the last paragraph, I'll write a paragraph that says, therefore, we should have done why. But no, they don't spend 30 pages analyzing why. <clears throat> and if you th spend 30 pages analyzing why, you in enter this mysterious world called choices. And uh, you have to analyze choices. And if you, an if you if think we should have conquered Iraq, you have to analyze that choice in as much detail as you analyze the decision not to conquer Iraq starting with considerations General Kelly mentioned in his opening statement. Thank you. Sir. Uh, my name is Ahmed al -Ghaili. I'm a student at the college. Um, I believe that the U.S. is better than end, uh, ending a war before its completion. So to be the advocate of the devil, I'm arguing that the U.S. deliberately ended the war before its completion because the, US, the U United States wanted a weak Saddam Hussein in the region um, to maintain his imaginary threats in the region, uh, and hence the Gulf states uh, would feel that they will always need uh, a U.S. presence in the region, and the U.S. Uh, interest would be maintained in the region. Well, I'll quickly respond to that. Uh, this argument is interesting. It just doesn't have the virtue of being true. Um, and, uh, and advocates for the devil never feel an obligation to be truthful. It's not part of the, uh, the charter. It, the de the devil uh, We're not that smart, by the way. <laughs> Believe me, we're not that good. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, gentlemen. My name is Adrian Marks, and I'm a first-year master's student here at the Kennedy School. My question is a follow-up to the previous discussion about the international coalition building. If Congress is successful in passing legislation which limits U.S. operations, U.S. support for future U.N. peacekeeping and military operations, effectively leaving the U.N. without its largest financial backer, will the U.S. cause irreparable harm to its ability to engender support from the international community and build such coalitions in the future? Um, quick answer, uh, not necessarily. Um, we did not construct this coalition out of a UN peacekeeping operation. We utilized United Nations political authority to create an ad hoc multinational coalition that most deliberately and explicitly was not under UN military command and was not a UN peacekeeping operation. But so nothing about that UN. apparatus would uh, I, helped or hindered 
the creation of the military coalition that worked. Uh, that apparatus has helped and hindered the creation of coalitions that have not worked. Last question. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Richard Parker. I'm a student at the Extension School. Um, after the war, General Schwarzkopf and a number of other people in the military hierarchy really criticized military intelligence and that some of the assessments made were so broad that they weren't really of value to the commanders in the field. Um, I was wondering if, they, if the panelists felt that that was an accurate assessment or if it was really just part of the friction and fog of war. And if that is the case, could that have helped account for the gate not being closed when they thought it was closed? Norm, Norm went there up before the uh, Congress and, and he had to say something. And the operator will always criticize the intelligence guy. It's, it's born and it's because we are innately superior to them, <laughs> in addition to being a hell of a lot better looking. <laughs> but one of the things he was complaining about was the pilots were flying missions with day old photographs. <laughs> Never in the history of the world have we done that well before. Uh, Mike McConnell sat next to me about 100% of the time. He was the admiral that was in charge of uh, uh, the intelligence effort in, uh, in, uh, in the Pentagon, and I was supremely impressed with what he did. And uh, intelligence is, is a bad business because if you do a perfect job, everybody says, oh, well. And if you miss one, and intentions are pretty tough, and we need to build our human intelligence capability in this country. We have over-relied on, on uh, technology. Uh, but if you miss one, the whole world comes down. And I think the intelligence folks could have done better. Uh, so did everybody else, but I will make my point. It turned out okay. I'd like to just make um, one squeeze one quick answer in there before the curtain comes down. Um, I think that um, I know I have a lot of some contacts and friends in the intelligence community. I think a lot of them are very good, and I think that there's no monolithic product from some of these people within the CIA. Some of the uh, predictions and forecasts were right on in terms of Iraqi intentions. Others were dead wrong, um, made by different uh, quarters of the same agency. But I think before we congratulate ourselves too much about the intelligence successes in the Gulf War, it's useful just to remember one thing. Um, there was a massive intelligence failure by the United States in understanding the progress that Iraq had made in its nuclear program. During the war, um, prior to the war, President Bush um, cited Iraq's nuclear threat as being a, a, a reason to go to war. And in reality, President Bush turned out to be right without even knowing it, uh, because the intelligence didn't really support what President Bush said at the time. But subsequent intelligence after the war, defectors came out, and we, uh, we learned a lot more about the program. And it turned out they had an entire clandestine nuclear program using calutrons, that, of which the CIA and the DIA had not a clue. And I've talked to these people about that. And I find that, given that that was an obvious target in an intelligence sense, Iraq's nuclear program, that they could have had such an underground program um, um, and, and surprised me. And a lot of the things the UN inspected, the reason the UN inspections are so important is a lot of critical things didn't get destroyed during the Gulf War. We knew there were suspect things. We didn't really know what they were. So that's a factor. Another quick example, Iraq had no biological weapons. There was a lot of hand-wringing. They had a biological warfare program, but they hadn't weaponized, as the UN discovered. And we had injections and bombing missions and all of that to destroy their biological weapons, which the UN later determined they hadn't quite progressed that far, not that they weren't trying. And also, if the last point, if you went, a useful exercise for anyone would be to look at, um, which General Trainer has mentioned too, and it, it, if you took the Schwarzkopf's famous mother of all briefings that we all watched, and I think you can probably get it on videotape somewhere, and I, th I thought it was a real tour de force, and at the end where he explained what the military situation was and uh, how he, how, well, how he, in reality, a lot of people at the Pentagon developed the strategy and, uh, and how uh, he mentioned the 540,000 man Iraqi army and things like that. And I think if you do a kind of an audit in an intellectual sense, you'll discover that the vast majority of assertions that General Schwarzkopf made in the Motherwell briefings turned out not to be the case, including the 400,000 Iraqi army, which never was that size according to post-mortem intelligence, it was probably more like 250,000 at the time of the war. In fact, we probably had numerical superiority by the time the war took place. This was not because the man was um, lying or manipulating us. I think he was operating on the basis of current intelligence and putting it in the best possible light. So clearly there's a lot of work to be done in that area. General Kelly, a quick one? Just a, a war story, because you know, as you get older, 
Uh, <laughs> during the Panamanian War, and we've had two victories in this country since World War II, Panama and the Persian Gulf. Uh, so I think that, uh, that whoever was in charge there did okay. Uh, we allege, I told the chairman and the secretary, that the F-117 had done a perfect job and it hit the target right on the button. And I was telling the truth because that's what was reported to me. And, and, a, and a smart reporter from the New York Times walked into my office one day and said, you did a perfect job there? And I said, yeah, they hit the target. You couldn't even cover it with a pencil. It was so perfect. And he handed me a couple of lousy little pictures that showed bomb holes in buildings. <laughs> Uh, that, that should not have been there. That was Michael. He had gone down to Panama and checked it out. And uh, the other side of the story, uh, you know, in the Paul Harvey regime, was that uh, we checked that out and we had an investigation and we <clears throat> appointed an Air Force, senior Air Force officer, to investigate it because it was the Air Force that was involved in whatever it was that was going on there. And he investigated it and it was very uh, difficult for him to do, but he told the truth and said, yep, somebody was, uh, somebody was fibbing. It was not a correct mission, et cetera. Uh, so that tells you that Michael is a superb investigative reporter and the fellow that was just nominated to be head of the CIA is an honest man. Thank you. Uh, I heard some of you whispering Grenada, Grenada when General Kelly was ticking off the list of victories. Grenada's like Pittsburgh. No one that's been there ever admits it. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> I'd like to conclude uh, with a reminder and an observation. The reminder is that at the reception, uh, these books will be on sale, and uh, I'm sure these gentlemen would uh, certainly uh, appreciate uh, a fistful of uh, purchases there. And the observation is that uh, now I've been told, and I, I find it credible, that the Kennedy School here is something of a revolving door between government and academia. Mick, I can assure you that if uh, General Powell ever becomes president, the revolving door will not operate in your particular case. <laughs> so you, you can plan on an extended career here to the benefit of the future. Thank you all.